Thank you very much for allowing your time for Sahabidia, the online encyclopedia of art and culture. You have been a major figure in Indian historiography since the 70s of the last century. You are more than that. Uh, uh, over the past six decades, you have been a cultural presence in Kerala. Your interests and achievements have been varied. Poetry, theatre, literary criticism, painting and so on. Can you tell us something about your background, social and intellectual, which enabled this? Uh, I come from an obscure village, uh, Parpalangadi, where I had no such uh, influences uh, of the contemporary society. But uh, for uh, high school education, I had to move to Ponani, because there was no high school in Parpalangadi. So I had my high school education in A.B. High School, that's the Warrior High School in Ponani, which was one of the very few uh, high schools in, in the Malabar region during that period. It is from there, life in Ponani, that I came to know people like uh, Rasheri Govind Nair, P.C. Kutikrishnan, uh, called Urub later. Kadavanad Krishnan, Akitab, and uh, that company, you know, that group of people who uh, created a kind of stir in our society. Uh, it, it's their um, uh, friendship which gave me ideas of the contemporary society and made me part of it, part of the movement. Uh, of the so-called Renaissance in Kerala. Right. This uh, association that you have with these uh, figures, Adasheri, Viti Bhattadiripad, Akitam and others, around that uh, Krishna Panikar Smaraga, Vayanashala yeah, in Bonani. Uh, yes, I remember that. Uh, around around that, that. That was on top that, of a building. Uh, no, I, I remember. Uh, I remember. Uh, but uh, your, uh, your association with these scholars and this institution, <coughs> you mean to say, was perhaps the first formative influence <coughs> on your intellectual development, particularly in relation to your appreciation of literature, appreciation of uh, contemporary events in politics and society. Uh, this, this leads to another question. Your high school education, particularly in Bonani, was during the last years of the freedom struggle. Hmm. If I remember right, yeah. you completed I your passed SSLC in, in the year of independence. 1947. In yeah. the year of independence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is what I that is yeah. what I remember. So, to what extent did the movement that was going on around? You must have been reading newspapers, at least old newspapers, if not the day's paper. You must have been following the events somewhat closely. The politics of contemporary society, particularly the Congress Party, Congress Socialist Party, then the Communist Party, which were developing at that time against the background of the Second World War, against the background of the last days of uh, British Empire in India. To what extent did it uh, influence your life and uh, thinking? A world view. Mm. I told you that I had my SSLC in 1947, the year of independence for India. After that, uh, uh, after that, I moved to Calicut for intermediate classes mm. because we didn't have any uh, outside Calicut. Of course, in Brandon College it was there, but Calicut was nearer for us. And in Calicut, in the then Zamarin's College, later called Zamarin's Guru Ayurban College, uh, we were exposed to all kinds of influences. Mm, in fact, I remember one thing. Mm, there was a competition for all sorts of things, and I um, cornered uh, a few 
first crisis, you know, this, that, poetry, essay writing, um, public speaking, speaking and all that. And of that, uh, uh, poetry especially, and later on, one um, Sunday or so, I was sitting in my, in my home, um, and then Adasheri go in there, whom I didn't know. Uh, he, he has uh, had acquired a, um, a reputation by that time. His uh, first uh, collection, Alagavali, had been published, and others were coming because uh, after the opening of the, um, what is that, All India Radio in Calicut, uh, these people had been coming to Calicut. And uh, one day I found that Adasheri Govinayar came to my house. I was uh, there sit, uh, seated um, in front, in the front room. And then he said, he asked me um, to call my father's elder sister, who was a school teacher and head, head teacher of the girls, girls' school. So uh, she came, came out. And then Adasheri told him, See, you must be careful. This fellow, he writes poems. Very dangerous person. He writes poems. It is then that I realized that Rasheri was the person who mm, looked into our competition papers and uh, marked me first. Right. It is after that that I came to uh, know Rasheri Goin Nair and his friend. Uh, P. C. Kutikrishnan. P. C. Kutikrishnan, in fact, was distantly related to my father's family, uh, and then we uh, uh, got into contact with Akitam, Karvanad Kutikrishnan, etc. There, uh, we used to, from Ponani, it's about uh, six miles or so, or four, five miles or so, to Jamarotam. So we used to go to Jamarotam. Uh, the, the river bed was open, you know, in those days hmm. when there was no flood. From Panani, we used to walk these four or five miles and then sit on the sand, sandy soil, you know, it, uh, saying this and speaking about this and that, all kinds of things. And that is where I came to know the ideas of these people, you know, going at the going there. P. C. Kutikrishnan, Kadavanad Kutikrishnan, Akitam. It was that uh, gave me the uh, exposure to the contemporary, the, the contemporary politics and uh, literary trends. Uh, now, <laughs> coming to history. History was not one of the more attractive subjects for intellectual no. pursuit in Kerala at <laughs> that time. That's true. Uh, at that time, in 1950s, Even when now, you chose that, yeah. when you chose that, Historical writing and research were marked by extreme backwardness. That's what true. attracted you towards this subject, which was such a lackluster subject at that time? It is not uh, history that attracted me. It is science which frightened me. <laughs> <laughs> so, because um, in the lab in the high school, we used to see skeletons hanging. <laughs> and uh, uh, they used to catch hold of uh, frogs, kill them, yeah. and then you have to dissect them. Uh, dissect them, paste them on the uh, walls and all that. This frightened me. I couldn't see blood or the sufferings of people. So in order to escape that kind of science, I took history. But then having taken history, I had a good experience of uh, one of the good teachers in history, K. V. Krishnayar. Oh, yes, the Zamorans. Uh, who was the author of the Jamanus of Calicut. He wrote that book in 1938. 38. 38. He was our teacher. And he had a way of teaching which was different um, and which was in advance of the uh, teaching methods of that period. Because he used to say, for example, when uh, he had to teach about Mamanka, uh, we used to take a bus and go to Tirunavai, see the temples there and the sandy soil there 
and it is from there that he explained things to us where the Nirabhata Tara was uh, and who all participated. So we read uh, um, K. V. Krishna's Examinations of Calicut where this is described at, at, the, at the site itself, you know. That was a new experience which uh, attracted me to history. Um, now, after a distinct, after your distinguished uh, performance in the Masters in history from the University of Madras, oh, no. uh, you settled down as a teacher in one of the colleges in Calicut. In fact, you were on alma mater, yeah. uh, where there were no openings for research, no possibilities of research. Mm -hmm. Calicut town at that Didn't. time never offered a possibility yeah. of any research. Yeah. This was perhaps one of the most productive period of your literary activities, particularly, yeah. particularly the literary criticisms, criticisms. that uh, you had written. Some of the trailblazing essays that you yeah. published yeah. on Wall of Thor, mm. uh, yeah. on um, Asha, your introduction to, your introduction to Erasheri's yeah. collected yeah. poems. Okay. This was the product yeah. of uh, th this period. How do you explain your shift in interest back to historical research from this? It was, you know, the committee huh. consisting of Akitam, P. C. Kutikrishnan, Erasheri and others who asked me to write this introduction for this selected verse of Erasheri. I know, a youngster to be asked to introduce Erasheri, mm -hmm. that itself is a great recognition. Ah, no, yeah. That was a great recognition and a great challenge for me. I was afraid of the responsibility. Therefore, I made a serious attempt uh, to read all his works, all the literary, contemporary literary <coughs> critical essays and all that, and made a lot of preparation for that uh, before I wrote that piece. Which is evident. Uh, uh, Which is evident. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, because of that, uh, I was thorough with that kind of uh, literature because of the fear. Huh. <laughs> sense of responsibility. No, no, I understand fear. that. And now my question is, what was responsible for this shift back mm. in historical research? Mm. Is there any, any That is after my anything which uh, uh, postgraduate course in Madras Christian College. Huh. During which we had a professor of history, Dr. Chandran Dev Nation, uh, who had a doctorate at that time and uh, who was highly celebrated, you know, as a historian. And uh, I was attached to the Heber Hall in the Madras mm. Christian College, where he was also the warden. And uh, he, uh, and not only he, his wife was a very sociable lady, very glamorous and all that. They used to invite us to their house. And we used to spend very interesting hours uh, in conversation with them discussing this and that and uh, arguing about this and that. It was that uh, gave me the training and the necessary right. equipment. Right, to study. History. Yeah. Now looking back, after you have established yourself most authoritatively as a historian of the country, how would you say that your literary sensibilities have helped in your historical research and vice versa? the historical sense that you developed through your researches, how did it help in your literary appreciation? Well, I think um, the difference, uh, the compartmentalization that you make is only for the sake of convenience. Actually, there is no difference between history and literature, uh, arts and culture and all that, you know. They are all mental activities which are related to each other, <laughs> which uh, help each other also. So this distinction that we make is uh, for examination purposes, <laughs> for convenience in teaching, etc. Otherwise, uh, they are all one. So will you will you agree with, uh, for example, writers like uh, Hayden White, mm. who believe that history is nothing but literature? Mm, I, I don't fully agree because uh, history I find earlier, history was uh, um, created or written based on sources and all that, mostly literary sources. Mm. Mm. What um, travelers had uh, observed and 
um, written. Uh, but uh, occasionally, some foreigner had written about this country. So, it was not a continuous history. Here and there, you had purple patches, you know, mm. where certain things were highlighted. But there is no continuous history in that. It's only the coming of archaeology which give, gave a, a new life to history. And I, I came to think that without archaeology, history is nothing. Mm -hmm. right. Archaeological sources, sources um, which you can see and touch and feel and criticize and uh, try to recreate or imitate, it is this that makes history different from literature. literature yes. uh, now coming back to your own career, about uh, about a decade after your uh, master's in Madras, mm. uh, you went back to historical research. But when you did that, you went to Trivandrum, yeah. which was not one of the reputed centers of historical research. Yeah. Why did you not go to uh, more established universities like Madras, your own alma mater, or Calcutta, or Benares, or Lahabad? which were great centers of historical they research were, at that time. But that was a thing of the past. I took more seriously to historical research and then the, what uh, really helped me was a um, UGC grant uh -huh. for research. I didn't know what research was. The <coughs> there was nobody to guide me. Not many people knew what research meant. So I had to start from scratch what research is and how others have been doing and all that. I made uh, Nilaganda Shastri's Cholas and Pandian Kingdom my models. And on that basis, Cholas, Chera, Pandyas and then what remained was Cheras. So I started working on that. Luckily for me, I started taking an interest in uh, ancient scripts, water, coal, etc. And uh, that gave me uh, the privilege to see the original sources, inscriptions. In fact, my uh, PhD work on Cheras is based on inscriptions only, mostly inscriptions about... I came to uh, study some 150 inscriptions re relevant to the Cheras, Chera inscriptions and allied inscriptions of other um, um, dynasties. That was a, a really uh, a great privilege for me because having mastered the old scripts like what are the, I could see the original sources and uh, that uh, made my PhD thesis uh, something very different from many others of the same oh, yes. period. Oh, yes. uh, it was a blessing for me that uh, A.L. Basham, wonder that was in and all that, no, commented on my work. He said, oh, here is a work uh, which is equal to 10 PhD theses and all that. Uh, and as, you, as you very rightly said, you went far beyond the routine requirements of a PhD thesis, working on your PhD thesis, mm. picking up uh, ancient scripts, uh, studying archaic languages like uh, Old Tamil, Sanskrit, etc. and also doing field work in very, very unhospitable conditions, I should say, going mm, from temple true. to temple, yeah. copying inscriptions in situ. You have done that. Can you, can you share some of your interesting experiences during the process? I think much of it started with my uh, inferiority complex. <laughs> <laughs> Because I had no patron, uh, no great uh, model, uh, except Nirana Shastri who was not easily approachable to me. Uh, but apart from that, there was no guide for my PhD work. Guide. By the way, who was your guide? <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> it was one um, Professor V. Narayana Pillai, um, who was the history professor in Kerala University. So, I had to select a, a guide. He was the only one that was available. He had no doctorate or anything. 
uh, when I went to him with uh, whatever work I was doing with the traps and all that, he said, don't come to me with this, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> I have never done any research and I cannot guide you properly. If you want to do any real good work, there is a person who is a friend of mine, Elangolan Kunjan Pillai, he is a Malayalam right. professor. Right. You go to him, I didn't know him, but with this uh, word of encouragement I went and met him. By the time I had done something and um, I had questioned some of his uh, uh, work, uh, criticized some of them, all that he went through. He said, Haran, if you think this is the right thing, you go ahead. Oh, he, that openness ah, he That had. was, you know, something unbelievable. Absolutely. People had to, told me that he was his main work was money lending. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> and he asked me, uh, also asked me, do you want any help? I can give you money. You don't have to pay me interest or anything <laughs> or any written document is to, to be not to be produced. And when I said that I had a I had disagreement with some of my, his work, he said, okay, go ahead. You go ahead, what you, what you think is right, you have to follow. Now that was a, a good beginning for me. And with this um, UGC grant, I started working. Mm. Then, uh, as, far as, the, as far as the old scripts were concerned, when I started studying, N. N. Kakkad was there. He was my classmate, mm. the poet, and a good friend. So he came uh, with the idea that uh, he also wanted to study old scripts and all that, and we started working together. Um, gradually, I collected about 150 inscriptions of the Chera period. Um, some of them are published, some of them are unpublished. So I collected them. I, I never published them in in one volume or anything, but all of them, all the copies, all the texts were available to me. So I thought that that could be made the basis of a PhD thesis. And when it was done, I got this, and um, I got the recommendation and appreciation of people like A.L. Basham. That gave me a big boost. Now we, have, we all know that uh, your uh, dissertation on the Perimals yeah. is a landmark. Yeah, it's a landmark not only in the history of Kerala, uh, perhaps yeah, in yeah. the historiography South of India's. the whole country. Mm. Uh, for the uncompromising fidelity yeah, to yeah, sources, yeah. historical material is the foundation of your uh, work on the Perimals, uh, particularly the influence of uh, historians like uh, D. D. Kosambi ah, and yeah, R. S. Sharma yeah. in the context of India. Mm. This is very clear. In spite of this, you fight shy of using the kind of terminology that these historians have uh, used. For instance, the model of Indian feudalism, ah. which could have very, very successfully explained the picture that uh, you were drawing. Mm. Why did you fight shy of that? Mm. I accepted uh, historical materialism, yeah. or the so-called Marxist uh, historiography. But even then, feudalism was a, a, a bone that could not be uh, um, uh, swallowed by me. So feudalism was something which um, I played with, but I didn't uh, fully um, absorb whether there was an Indian feudalism as uh, R.S. Sharma has uh, described. However, Sharma ji was very kind to me. In our personal dealings, he was in Delhi and uh, I used to go there occasionally. And whenever we met, um, he thought that I was his South Indian disciple. Feudalism, he had uh, that book, you know. In fact, uh, in, in one of his landmark papers, on the bhakti movement, ah. which you were uh, graceful enough to to include your research assistant as a co-author. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> no, but uh, there you very very articulately say that uh, bhakti was an ideology of the emerging feudal formation. Yeah. 
by the time you published this bhakti paper you had uh, uh, given up the shyness of uh, using the word uh, feudalism what prompted you to think differently from the received wisdom which perceived bhakti as a religious philosophical phenomenon with some content of uh, uh, protest against caste yeah. etc that was because by that time i had accepted the marxist theory uh, of historical explanation <clears throat> therefore uh, anything like bhakti you know it must have a foundation in uh, social contradictions right. class class antagonism class relations and all that that is what made me take that route that was also the time when you were very active in the indian history congress yeah. were some of your more important papers such as the one on hundred organizations or uh, kandalur sale or cattle raids peasant settlements warrior groups etc were published looking back how do you rate this most productive period of your research i don't know it is difficult to explain what made me do so what sustained me and all that but no, one you thing you were doing it as if with a vengeance ah that is true <laughs> because i used to attend the history congress every year but i made it a, a rule that i will not attend a congress without a paper so every year at least one or two papers i i produced for that i had to do a lot of work and uh, it's only when a paper was ready that um, i was ready to go to the history congress this kind of a religious uh, woe made me produce all those papers at mm. that time perhaps the one on cattle raids that you wrote uh -huh. that had immense potentials mm. particularly as uh, the way in which booty was captured how it was unequally distributed yeah. etc it had immense potentials of bringing about a kind of an anthropological turn in historiography unfortunately it did not bring it about in south indian historiography any any hunch about uh, the reason for its uh, failure I to know, provoke no, no. i can't explain this but one thing i didn't no, i should of... believe it as uh, uh, it, uh, to be one of the best papers you have written well it was a good paper i liked it but i didn't do any further work on that you didn't do it uh, unfortunately others did not pursue it also didn't, didn't. okay right now you are responsible in a big way again i am talking about early south indian history uh, in uh, initiating a rereading of what is called sangam literature uh, in south indian history uh, for instance uh, a scholar a scholar like uh, kailasavathi mm. although he was in public domain for nearly two decades he was practically a stranger in south indian academia that it was you who oh. introduced his work i do not know if you personally knew him no yeah, i didn't and it was you who introduced this work to south india it was you who introduced this yotambi's work to south india yeah and and how do you explain all, all how do you explain south india's uh, refusal to accept scholars like aila sabathi and uh, shivathambi sri lankan scholars like uh, aila sabathi and uh, shivathambi they were not uh, known or accepted in south india among historians somehow or other i got no, can you say uh, harder harsher word they yeah. were blacked out in south india i don't think i don't think that uh. that was the case you know people did not uh, recognize their significance that's all but somehow or other a copy of kailasavathi's work came into my hands when i was in london you were in london then i remember yeah one copy and that was an eye opener to me so from hailas kailasavathi i went to tambi and uh, others you know the whole group of historians no i remember the first sentence in kailasavathi the word sangam literature is a misnomer yeah, yeah. how can yeah. you possibly imagine a tamil accepting this so that is why i asked you is it a blacking out <laughs> no. and tamils were not ready to accept anything <laughs> except the adjective classical right. 
for Sangam literature. Whereas I th and um, others also later on, I think, uh, started thinking about it as uh, primitive, primitive oral history. Now, can I ask a question about you as a teacher of history? I have always felt that you taught history differently, differently from other teachers that I was familiar with. You would go to the sources and discuss them, encourage your students to read the sources rather than repeat what historians yeah, have written on the basis of these sources. Uh, this, even where what you were teaching was outside your own area of primary research. Yeah. Even when, for example, when you taught us uh, Maurin history, Maurin, yeah. you would take out a copy of Arthashastra, then inscriptions of Ashoka. This was the way in which, uh, somewhat uh, lawlessly, this was, this was what you were doing. Who was your model in this kind of a teaching? There was no model for me uh, at that time. If you if you did not have a model, what was the inspiration behind this? I didn't know how to lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so, what to do? <laughs> Go into the class, you know. One has to teach the subject. I studied the subject and uh, how to explain it to the students was uh, not known to me. But one thing. I had the example of K. V. Krishnayar, right. Uh, right. who was my first teacher when I came to the college. Um, he used to take us to Tirnavai to tell us about Mamangam. He used to take us to temples, um, palaces, etc., uh, make them make us see the sites of history. That was in those days, you know, uh, seminars, symposia, and uh, uh, such dialogues were not very common. They, they had not entered the field of teaching history. But that example, that inspired me. Right. Now, in the syllabi that uh, you introduced in Gaelic, uh, yeah. which you went on Later. happening every yeah. now and again, yeah, yeah. Uh, there were many innovative elements, uh, unheard of in other universities in India at that time. Yeah, For instance, so. There was uh, the source-based study, Kerala history from sources. Now, that is the course that I had done with you. Similarly, there was a, an optional dissertation, which yeah. you introduced at MA level. There were a large number of papers, problems in Indian history, yeah. problems in this, uh, this problem-oriented uh, study of history, rather than survey courses. Yeah. Uh, in these innovative techniques, again, what could have been the inspiration that you had? Uh, um, it's not uh, inspiration as such. But you remember I had a colleague, Sri Kumar Nair. Uh, he had, what is that, some kind of a fellowship and mm. went to... Fulbright. Fulbright. Uh, went to the States and came back. There he had studied uh, historical theory and historiography. These two subjects were unknown to Indian historians at that time. And from Sri Kumar Nair, I mastered it. From his example and his uh, help and guidance, we were good friends. Mm. So it is from him that I copied it. As uh, one who has uh, trained several generations of uh, historians in South India, I don't or know. Students, of history, <laughs> students of history in South India, are you happy? With the, with the state of uh, uh, historical writing in Kerala, in South India at large, or in the whole of the country. Are you, are you happy with the state of the discipline in the country? No, no, no. You are not? No. Because, see, people still adhere to certain petty ideas and theories and quarrel with each other. Without a broad mm, approach to uh, history, the, the common laws, you know, general laws about history, causation and all that. Uh, those things are not there. Mostly people follow parties and uh, try to please them. Now, this is a very um, humiliating experience for me. So, if I, if I say that uh, you are uh, um, uh, not, uh, you are somewhat disappointed with uh, the, the state of affairs, yeah. will you agree with me? Yeah. Uh, now, 
uh, that leads me to a very, very uh, hypothetical kind of questions. If you were to have another birth <laughs> and if you were given the choice, if you were given the choice, would you choose to be a historian? I can't <laughs> say that, I can't say that. No. <laughs> but one thing, uh, since I fell into history in a way, because I hated the, the other subjects. And then, of course, uh, the, the way in which uh, teachers like Krishna had taught us. Krishna, yes, the and others. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. It was enjoyable. Educate you as always. <laughs>